Welcome to Loop TV. I'm your host, Gene Munster, joined by Doug Clinton. Our topic today is what to do with high-tech stocks amidst the market turbulation. As we speak, the NASDAQ is down a percent and a half, down 2% over the past week. It down, it's down about just over 3% since it spiked after the Fed's meeting last week. Bring in Doug from Loop here. And uh, just a little bit of a, the lay of the land here at Loop. Every Monday morning, we spend a special amount of time on a market view. We always are updating our analysis uh, related to how we should position the portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but Monday is a particular day where we spend a lot of time talking about the macro. And here we are on Monday. And Doug, I maybe just uh, kick us out. Market's down a lot. The old adage, uh, buy the pullback long-term is, is the best way to go. That's what your wealth manager will likely advise you to do. Uh, what's your view on the market if you have the option of being having a little bit more flexibility in terms of timing? Uh, I, I'd make two points. So one, we're not at, uh, macro experts. No one is really a macro expert. It's really hard to get that right. But I think what we're, what we're sort of facing right here is this question, particularly with tech, which is, are these companies that are getting really beaten down actually values? And I think that you have to kind of ground yourself in what are these companies going to generate in terms of future cash flows? That's ultimately what determines value. It's not the technologies they develop. It's not how excited people get about these stocks as we've seen over the last year. It's really ultimately the cash flow they generate. And so when we think about what is the macro telling us and you know, it feels like the market just is not happy with tech, it kind of work, wants to work itself down. We just try to ground ourselves in value. And I think that's the best thing you can do right now is if you can find great values, invest in them for the long term. But in terms of the macro, I would be prepared for some more volatility, some more rockiness throughout the rest of the year. A good perspective from my view, uh, or just maybe start with your view on, you talked about some volatility for the next of the year, maybe into the beginning of next year. Why do you expect such volatility? I would start with the FANG names. And if you really think about the performance of the market this year, I mean, the market's still up despite what we've seen the past couple of weeks. I think the NASDAQ is still up over 15% since the beginning of the year. And if you look at the data, if you actually parse out where that performance came from, uh, we've seen some data that suggests that about 80% of the market's performance year to date has been from the mega cap tech names that everybody owns, a lot of the FANG names, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Tesla. And so if you back those out, the market is closer to flat right now, actually, now that we've had this volatility. And so to me, the thing that I think you should look for, if you're really going to try to you know, time the market and try to figure out what's going to happen in the near term is really what happens to FANG. Do they crack? And so we did a quick analysis, which relates to uh, interest rates. We all know that the Fed is going to increase interest rates next year. That feels like uh, beyond consensus at this point. Everybody's expecting it. If you increase the discount rate by 1%, so reflecting essentially a 1% higher uh, risk-free rate, and you look at what happens to the models for these FANG names, uh, by our math, it's about a 15 to 20% headwind for a lot of these names. Now, some of the FANG names have already pulled back from their highs, but if you just kind of look at what's kind of left, and really, if you believe in this, 1% should be a 15 to 20% headwind, I still think there's maybe 10 or, uh, 10 or 12% to go if those names ultimately do reflect that interest rate reality. So that to me is kind of the bogey is that you have to pay attention to is if the market really does factor in these interest rates, that to me would be probably the all clear sign uh, if it does happen. You just a uh, finer point on that interest rate piece and the inflation piece. Interest rates are one way that the Fed can um, manage inflation, of course. And uh, Chairman Powell's comments, I watched his comments uh, at the press conference twice. His comments were pretty clear that they have uh, set into action some things that will uh, start to reel in inflation unless the data tells them different and then they have tools, aka the interest rate to work with. And uh, unless the data uh, turns out to be different or as the data ends up trending in a different direction, the next logical point there is kind of middle of January when the inflation number comes out. 
So uh, play us forward to January and let's take the view that inflation remains hot. Let's say it's above 6%, it was 6.8%, maybe it's above seven. Uh, the CPI at a, a little bit of a surge, uh, which uses a leading indicator for the inflation number for January. But if we play that forward, what's the market reaction if inflation continues to be running high in the December numbers and what's the read through on interest rates? Again, I mean, I'm, I'm not a macro expert. I think that at this point, though, you know, the market had been pricing and it seemed a rate increase in the summer. After this past meeting, it feels like that's probably moving up to May or maybe even the March meeting. I don't know that a really hot number in, uh, in January for the December month would change that all that much. I mean, there's still some, I think, uh, just some realities of them winding down this taper, it might be harder for them to do it much faster than they're doing it now. I mean, they could just end it immediately, but that would obviously create, I think, even more volatility in the markets. And so I think you, you, you probably have to, no matter really what happens with inflation, unless it's just you know absolutely well outside the bounds of what anybody expects, I don't think that would change much in terms of the Fed action. Um, the other point I would make too is, you know, we're talking about all these things with the Fed, and uh, I've mentioned consensus a few times. and at Loop, we are very careful to try to find contrarian ideas. We're believers that you know the only way to really generate extraordinary investment returns is to do something that is different than the market's expecting. The other side of that that I think doesn't get talked about enough, though, is you don't want to be contrarian and wrong. You don't want to make that bet that the rest of the market doesn't believe in and end up being wrong because then you get crushed. And so the danger I think we have right here is market's volatile. Market is saying there's probably maybe still more to come. We know this interest rate piece is coming. And, uh, you know, the buy the pullback mentality that you talked about earlier, Gene, I think is uh, probably at this point a little contrarian. But I think there's more danger that that ends up being contrarian and wrong finally, even though it's been the right thing to do the last 18 months. Um, I think it might finally be contrarian or wrong because we do have these headwinds that I think still have not fully worked themselves out into the market. So let's play it forward to, I know this uh, isn't quite your view, but let's say inflation continues to be high on the December read and investors have some uh, angst about uh, rates going up a little bit faster when the Fed meets, the next meeting is at the end of January. Uh, what does it mean ultimately, you talked about cash flow at the beginning, uh, what does it mean uh, for the market multiple when we think about maybe uh, the prime rate going from one and a half to two and a half percent, something like that? I mean, simply, it just means multiples need to come down. Or the way that we've talked about it is you have to believe one of two things is going to happen. Either every you know, equity, and in particular, let's talk about FANG, because that's where we've done the most work. You have to believe that when interest rates go up, either those names all of a sudden are going to be able to grow much faster than what's already been priced into those stocks. Or you have to believe that multiples are going to contract and the prices are going to come down. Like one of two things has to be true. Um, you can't have neither. And so if I had to make a bet, I would go back to uh, reason would suggest that multiples probably come down uh, because rising interest rates uh, shouldn't have any effect on the future growth of those great companies that uh, you know, everybody has a lot of exposure to. I'm glad you mentioned at the top that we are not market uh, uh, experts here. We're tech experts, we are long-term investors. And so everything we've talked about here is kind of over the, the next month to two month. And I will say that when we look at the data and think about what the Fed's doing, and uh, usually uh, the market bottoms before that first rate increase. So I think if you zoom back and take uh, a view, uh, one, two, five year kind of a view here, it is uh, a lot of noise. If you are looking to be more judicious and uh, timely, uh, there's probably an opportunity here for the markets to soften. But I think the long term, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity around some of these transformative names, at least that we are trafficking in, it doesn't really change would you uh, over the next couple months do you agree with that disagree i think that's probably the right way to think about it and and there's this funny dynamic where everybody uh, wants to say just ignore the macro just invest in great companies but when the world feels like it's kind of falling apart uh, i think you do have to pay attention to the macro and it and if you kind of look throughout history right the market usually goes through long periods of sort of this this you know placid state 
where uh, nothing really intense is happening from an economic standpoint. You get shocks like COVID every once in a while, and then you have major macroeconomic blowups like uh, 2008. But what I think we have happening here is this sort of reconciling of we've had easy monetary policy for a long time. We've had a lot of speculation uh, coming off of COVID, driven by stimulus, driven by things in crypto, meme stocks, all these incredible things. Um, and I think that now it is a time to pay a little bit more attention to the macro and just be sane, just be safe, always revert back to value and cash flow. Um, but I think this is one of those periods where people should take a little bit more care in that. Ton of sense. I'm on the same page. Uh, we like to be on different pages, by the way. In this case, we're on the same page. Uh, on behalf of Doug and the environment, which is going to be continuing to move at a rapid pace, we're going to have lots to talk about in the weeks uh, to come. And Loop TV, I'm Gene Munster. Bye for now.